I'll start screen. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, okay, um, just make sure the sharing screen is working. Yep, yep. Cool, good. Okay, um, so I'm gonna start off um, by uh, just recapping the very end of yesterday's lecture. Um, so uh, yesterday we, we talked about this spectral form factor very briefly. You take two copies of the thermal partition function and you analytically continue beta to beta plus IT and beta to beta minus IT. Uh, and this quantity, the spectral form factor, is like an auxiliary quantity for studying the level statistics. Uh, it depends on pairs of energies, that, uh, and in particular has these phases that uh, are proportional to the energy differences. So we uh, asked, what does this thing look like, the spectral form factor, if you average over it, you average over the uh, ensemble of GUE Hamiltonians. And we found this structure, this uh, uh, slope, ramp, and plateau. And the ramp and plateau come from the, the sine kernel contribution to the uh, pair correlation function. Uh, where the ramp is something a little bit sim uh, simple in terms of these, this uh, pair correlation function. It's the perturbative piece of the sine kernel where you average out the oscillations. Um, but the plateau uh, comes from these, these rapid oscillations. So the in terms of the uh, uh, matrix, in the, the integral over GUE Hamiltonians, the ramp is something that's easier to see. It's perturbative in one over L. The plateau is something that's non-perturbative in one over L. Um, and so real quick, I'm gonna say, okay, our goal for today is going to be to try to see, what, see, how, to, see how to calculate the spectral form factor in gravity and find uh, signatures of these ramps and plateaus. Um, so gravity, uh, we usually think of as, in ADS-CFT, we usually have a definite Hamiltonian. Um, not, we're not averaging over random Hamiltonians. And so uh, what we might expect to get out of gravity is something that looks like the spectral form factor for a typical draw of a Hamiltonian for, from the GUE ensemble, for example. This would just be a toy model to, uh, for our expectations. So we can ask, what does the spectral form factor look like for a fixed Hamiltonian, a uh, typical one of order one probability in the GUE ensemble? So you can plot it in Mathematica, uh, and that's some homework if you guys are interested. Uh, Mathematica is a nice way of generating GUE Hamiltonians. And we find this, this sort of picture. Here I've drawn it so that it's like a log log plot. Um, you start out at this large value, order L squared and you decay. But when you start to get where, to where the average ramp would be, you find a very noisy signal. So the, the red signal is the function for a fixed Hamiltonian. The black line underneath is the ensemble average. So we can see the, no, the signal is noisy and oscillates erratically around the average ramp and then erratically around the average plateau. So for a fixed Hamiltonian, you don't see the ramp and plateau exactly, you see a big noisy function. And in fact, the size of the noise is, is about, uh, is the same size as the signal itself. So the, uh, down here, we can say the ramp is of order one. Uh, and that means the, the oscillations are also size of order one. Over here, the ramp has gotten to size of order L and the size of the oscillations is of order L around it. So the oscillations are big. And so in some sense, the ramp and the plateau are a bad approximation to the spectral form factor for a specific uh, choice of Hamiltonian. So if we are considering a fixed Hamiltonian without averaging, is there any sense in which the ramp and plateau are meaningful? Um, so I just wanna emphasize that we can indeed make them meaningful by not averaging over an ensemble of Hamiltonians, but taking a fixed Hamiltonian and averaging the spectral form factor, for example, over time windows or in some other way. So if we take this noisy signal and we say we average over a little time window here, average over a little time window here, and here and here and here, we expect that, and we can show that in some cases, the noise should average out, leaving behind this ramp. And so maybe in other systems, there's additional ways to average. Um, 
So you take a fixed system and you can average over time. Maybe you can average over some coupling constants or something like that. Um, but there's, there's various ways for even a fixed system to average out the noise in the spectral form factor and find this ramp in a plateau. So we think these should be there in some sense, uh, even for fixed Hamiltonian systems. Um, so let's keep that in the back of our mind as we're trying to study spectral form factor in gravity. Um, so one note about uh, uh, our new perspective trying to do this in gravity uh, is that these perturbative one over L effects uh, that describe the ramp in uh, the random matrix theory are non-perturbative effects in gravity. That's because our perturbation theory in the random matrix theory was in one over the size of the Hilbert space, which is L. But in gravity, the, the uh, size of the Hilbert space is uh, like E to the S, uh, where S, the entropy of a black hole, is one over G Newton. So ordinarily we do perturbation theory in G Newton, but these effects that we're looking for that are one over L are exponentially small in G Newton. So that is gonna make these effects a little bit more uh, uh, novel. Um, okay, so now we're gonna get to, uh, well, I've, I've written the title up top, the ramp from a wormhole. That's a bit of a uh, heads up for what's gonna come later. But what we're gonna start uh, with is just try to calculate a partition function in gravity. So the spectral form factor is two copies of the partition function analytically continued. So to get started, let's just calculate the partition function, um, C of beta. So in regular quantum mechanics, the partition function trace e to the minus beta h can be written as a path integral uh, periodic in Euclidean time. So Euclidean time tau uh, is periodic in beta. Uh, beta is the inverse temperature. So in ADS CFT, what this means is that you fix the metric on the asymptotic boundary to be periodic in Euclidean time. Uh, and because the boundary is, has infinite length, what we want to do is fix a renormalized version of the length. And we'll see some detail about that in a moment. Um, so here I've, I've drawn a picture of uh, an example geometry that contributes to the partition function in ADS CFT. So out at the boundary, the geometry is asymptotically Euclidean ADS uh, with period uh, in Euclidean time beta. Uh, but inside, we integrate over all geometries that have these, these asymptotic boundary conditions. Um, so here, the picture is for like 2D gravity, and like I can't draw a higher dimensional version of this. So ordinarily, when we try to study the partition function in gravity, it's dominated by a classical solution. Um, and for uh, sufficiently high temperatures above the Hawking page transition, uh, uh, it's dominated by the uh, Euclidean black hole. Um, so we're, we're interested in studying black holes, so we're going to restrict our attention to these high temperatures uh, where this uh, black hole solution should dominate. Um, and so then we can compute the, the partition function. We just find this classical solution, the Euclidean black hole, take its action, maybe consider some perturbative fluctuations around it, and we get a function z of beta, which we can then attempt to continue with uh, beta going to beta plus it. And then this might be a contribution to the spectral form factor, or we take that and take its modulus squared. Um, but the problem is that we're interested in studying these very long times. We would take T to be something like maybe uh, even proportional to L or something like that. So this would be exponentially long times uh, in gravity. So at, if we're taking this function, which we computed perturbatively from the saddle point, and then continuing it to these very, very, very long times, um, we may lose control over the perturbation series. Maybe that there's large perturbative corrections that we can't really calculate because they depend on time and time is becoming very large. So in general, it's, it's difficult to have a, have a nice control over uh, this function computed uh, in this way from the black hole saddle point. Um, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna restrict our attention to a nice simple model of gravity, uh, JT or Jakeev Teitelboim gravity, because um, in this case we have control. So this JT gravity um, is gonna be basically our main model that we're gonna study for today's lecture and tomorrow's lecture. Um, it's very simple and we can, we can say a lot about it. And it's got some interesting surprising uh, facts about it. 
So here I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction to JT gravity. It's a two-dimensional theory of dilaton gravity. So we have a metric, G mu nu, and we have a, a dilaton phi. Um, the cosmological constant is negative in this model, and we set it to minus two. Uh, turns out to be a simple choice. Um, so you can think of this model, JT gravity, as part of the dimensional reduction of a near extremal four-dimensional black hole. Uh, so uh, the near horizon geometry of one of these higher dimensional near extremal black holes looks like uh, ADS2. So, so this JT gravity is a theory of ADS2 gravity. Um, but, um, or, and uh, in that case, so this higher dimensional geometry, this four dimensional black hole has a, has a two sphere. Uh, and in the dimensional reduction of JT gravity, the size of this two sphere is related to the dilaton. So the size of the two sphere uh, is like this phi, call it sub dr for dimensional reduction. It's equal to a large value phi naught plus phi, which is the field we integrate over. Um, and so in the higher dimensions, the area of this two sphere at the horizon is the entropy of the black hole. So in JT gravity, we think of the entropy as uh, phi naught, this large value, uh, plus this uh, plus the value of our uh, fluctuating phi at the horizon. So this is just a, a way to think about JT gravity um, to connect it to sort of uh, more conventional uh, higher dimensional gravity. But what we're going to do is we're going to take this theory at face value, just 2D gravity, forget about the dimensional reduction, and we're going to work with it uh, on its own. And so I've written here the Euclidean action for JT gravity uh, as a sum of three terms. So we're going to talk about each term uh, one by one. They each have uh, an important role. So the first term here, we can see the appearance of just the normal Einstein uh, Hilbert term in the action. Um, and we have a bound, uh, now this boundary term. Uh, so this is a little bit messy, but this is the boundary of the manifold and extrinsic curvature. So in two dimensions, this Einstein term is, is trivial. Uh, it's just topological. So altogether, this term is just proportional to the Euler character of the manifold, which you're evaluating the action on. Um, and we've given this, this uh, uh, Euler character uh, term uh, co co uh, coefficient S naught. S naught is like the uh, phi naught I mentioned in the previous slide. So S naught is a large number that's going to be uh, part of the entropy of the system. So the second term here, uh, we have a, a term which is the dilaton multiplying uh, R plus two. So this would be the cosmological constant. Um, and so we can see that if we uh, vary phi to get some equations of motion, uh, we find the equation of motion R plus two equals zero. Um, so can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. This S naught is the entropy of the four dimensional black hole, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, but it's not the entropy of the two dimensional system that you're considering, so. Um, we will find that it contributes to the entropy also, yeah. But this is the, the way to think about, that is the right way to think about it in terms of the dimensional reduction. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So um, this term here um, will allow us to focus only on uh, constant negative curvature metrics. And those are simple. They're just pieces of uh, Euclidean ADS2, which is just pieces of hyperbolic space. We'll talk more about that in a moment. So finally, um, the last term here uh, gives an action for the boundary. So because we're computing a partition function, we have an asymptotic boundary and we have to regularize it. Um, and uh, this will give some action for that, for that boundary. Uh, and so this is actually somewhat important. Um, basically because the bulk is constant negative curvature, all the sort of dynamics comes from just the uh, boundary. And then a final comment, which is that, um, so if we're computing a partition function, we have to fix boundary conditions for the metric and the dilaton at infinity. Um, so we've already said what we want to do with the metric. We want to consider uh, uh, geometries that have a uh, that are have a length of the boundary which is uh, proportional to beta. Um, but we also need to fix the value of the dilaton at the boundary. If you look at the equations of motion for phi, it tends to grow towards a large radius. So what we're going to do is fix phi to be some uh, one, but at the boundary 
renormalized by some factor of epsilon. So phi diverges at the boundary, and we're going to fix this renormalized value. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. I might have missed this, but uh, when you say it sets r equal to minus 2, you mean on shell, right? On shell, but in a moment we'll say, actually, I'll, I'll say this now. Um, our, when we do the path integral, we're going to take a strategy where we integrate over phi first. And we're integrating phi over, we, we can define the model so that phi is integrated over the imaginary axis. Then this is like a delta function term in, in the action. Um, so as a, so phi sets r equals minus 2 as a delta function. Okay. So it's even off shell, yeah. Me, another question? Mm -hmm. Boundary conditions. So here you are imposing the Dirichlet boundary conditions, which is what you are doing in GTK, right? But what is there a clear interpretation or even um, how to study a model where you don't impose Dirichlet boundary conditions? You impose Dirichlet in my model. Yeah, there's there's actually a paper about this somewhat recently um, by some postdocs at Stanford. Um, I don't have a good understanding of it, but they they talk about they classify the different boundary conditions. They sort of talk about what each one might mean. Um, uh, maybe I'll try to think about it. it's it's maybe it's just called classifying boundary conditions in JD gravity. Um, I don't remember the precise title. Uh, um, but yeah. Um, okay, so now that we have this this action. Uh, let's talk about how do we compute the partition function Z of beta in JT gravity. And eventually we're gonna use this to try to compute the spectral form factor. And also the techniques for computing the partition function are gonna be useful for computing all the space-time wormhole contributions that we'll eventually think about. Um, so there's a lot of detail. Um, it's, it's, what we're gonna to try to do is get an exact formula for Z of beta. And uh, so it's somewhat complicated and involved. And uh, I'm not going to go over every single detail, but I'm going to try to highlight the uh, sort of important points. Um, OK, so first, as I sort of just said, our strategy is going to be to integrate first over phi, the dilaton. Um, and the uh, upside of doing that is that phi, the phi integral is like a delta function integral setting r plus 2 equals 0 identically. So that means we're only integrating over metrics where uh, with that, which have this constant negative curvature. And those are just pieces of hyperbolic space. So when we consider this problem of the partition function, where we have this asymptotic boundary, we'd like to fill in the middle. The middle has to be filled out with just a piece of the hyperbolic disk. So here I have a picture of it. Uh, the hyperbolic disk is illustrated with this uh, Escher, uh, I guess these are fish or birds uh, picture. There's a lot of uh, volume out at the boundary. And here I've, here I've drawn a, I've written a metric for the space and some coordinates. Rho is like the radius outwards. And you can see that there's a, a lot of space out near the boundary, at large row. Um, and so the, the rules are for, for compu computing the partition function are that we integrate over geometries, which are pieces of this disk um, where the boundary in, drawn in red has a length beta over epsilon. The, and the dilaton at the boundary, so we've integrated over the dilaton in the middle, but at the boundary, it's fixed to be just one over epsilon. Um, and then what we do is we're going to take epsilon to infinity, sorry, to zero. Um, so this will, this is our, our definition of the computation of the partition function in JT gravity. Um, so uh, instead of just a side comment, we can think about epsilon as the sort of cutoff radius for this, this piece of the disk. Are you fixing the real part and integrating over the imaginary part of phi? Uh, because you said the integral is over the imaginary axis, but on yeah. the boundary, you are fixing it to real value. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's a number of approaches to doing this integral. So maybe I'll, I'll go back for a second and say, so what are, what are we? what is the integral that we're doing? Well, the geometry in the middle is fixed. The only thing that we have that's different for our geometries is the shape of this boundary. Um, so we can think about the path integral over metrics as just a path integral over the shape of the boundary. Uh, and so there's a number of approaches to trying to do this integral. Um, and I've listed a number here. Uh, and they, they all give the same answer, of course. Uh, I'm going to sort of talk about one, one method in particular that 
uh, connects to uh, uh, what's called the short scene theory, uh, somewhat simply. And the short scene theory is, uh, uh, is how the this JT gravity connects to the SYK model, which is another toy model of holography that is approximately described by JT gravity. But I'm not going to really get into that. That's just a side comment. Um, so one thing that's what, that uh, uh, to keep in mind it's somewhat important is that uh, our strategy is going to be to think about this boundary curve. We're going to we're going to write the boundary curve in some coordinates. We're going to parameterize it by sort of a, a row of, of some uh, parameter and a theta of some parameter. And we can think about integrating over this, uh, uh, the boundary curve uh, uh, functions. And it's very important that we don't over count um, because let's say we take this, this boundary curve, this defines a geometry and we shift the boundary curve up in this direction or rotate it or something like that. Those give the same shape, the same piece of geometry, just they just be parameterized differently in these rho and theta coordinates. So we don't want to overcount by integrating separately over different parameterizations of the same uh, boundary curve. So that's just a, a, a little uh, uh, complication. Um, so let's see. Um, I'm not sure how much, I've written more than I plan to actually talk about. I'm not sure how much detail to go into. Um, maybe I'll, I will not go too much into this slide. This is the saying we can parameterize the boundary in terms of some functions theta of mu and rho of mu where, uh, or view where u is, we can think of as the boundary time. So u is uh, time along this boundary curve and the total time has to be beta, um, beta over epsilon. And then um, in those coordinates, uh, you, change co you can change coordinates to u and r, where r is something like the distance to the boundary. u again is this time along the boundary. And there's a nice way to write the metric and the extrinsic curvature of the boundary in terms of a function uh, short scene of u, which is this complicated function of these of theta of u. Um, so uh, the JT gravity boundary action is like the dilaton at the boundary, which we fix to be one from normalized times the curvature minus one. So we just pick out this term here. And it turns out that you can rewrite this uh, 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 the JT gravity action, the boundary term, as the integral of the Schwarzian derivative of this function of theta of mu uh, in this limit where we take this renormalization parameter epsilon to zero. So um, what is this Schwarzian derivative? Well, it's a, I've written it here, um, but the important fact about it is that it's, in, it's, it's invariant under certain transformations to theta. There, it's invariant under SL2R transformations of theta of mu, which correspond to rotating this boundary curve or uh, translating it in one of these two directions. So those two transformations of theta correspond to different parameterizations of the same piece of ADS2. So this action uh, is going to be invariant under the uh, uh, these reparameterizations of the of the boundary curve that give that keep the geometry the same. So that's that must have been true. We shouldn't have a different action for different parameterizations of the curve. And in fact, uh, I think this the short scene action is, is somewhat unique. So uh, you may may it, it would have been reasonable to have guessed that the action should some, be something like proportional to the short scene. Um, so uh, I'll leave maybe uh, as an exercise for interested uh, people to look back at this slide and try to work out these, these, these facts about these boundary curves, which are true in the large uh, cutoff limit. Um, okay, so now that we have a, we've, what we've done is we parameterized our boundary curves by this function theta. We found an action uh, as a function of theta. And then you can try to integrate over theta modulo these SL2R uh, transformations of theta. Um, so integrating over theta in general is hard. Uh, so we'll start by uh, looking at the saddle point. The saddle point is very simple. It's just a circular boundary. It's parameterized by just a, a nice simple theta is proportional to u. Um, and you can plug it into the short scene action and find this, this, this uh, uh, action. So just going back, the saddle point is just a constant, it's just a circle. Uh, 
of constant rho. Uh, but uh, as I had said earlier, what we want to do is look at these very long times. We take beta to beta plus it and take t to be very large. Um, so in that case, we're going to really need to make sure that all the quantum fluctuations around the saddle point are controlled. And this short scene theory, um, I'll go back for a moment, is a complicated nonlinear theory. So uh, the short scene as a function of this thing, we plug this tan of theta into this definition of the short scene, and it's very ugly in terms of theta. Um, so you may think, how is there any hope of uh, uh, doing this path integral uh, and getting an answer that we can, we can compute? Well, this turns out uh, that this short scene in theory, this path integral over theta with the short scene action is what's called one loop exact, which, is that, which means the path integral uh, is equal to the e to the minus action times the one loop determinant of the fluctuations, the quadratic fluctuations around the action. And that's it. There's no higher order Feynman diagrams uh, around uh, the saddle point. Everything cancels. Um, so this was shown by uh, Douglas Stanford and Edward Witten um, for the short scene theory. And I have a, my next slide just goes over sort of some of the key points behind why that's true. I'm not going to talk about it. I'll just leave that for anyone who's interested. But just to summarize, uh, what this one loop exactness says is that Z of beta, where we've integrated over all these geometries that are just pieces of this hyperbolic disk is equal to E to the Euclidean action of the circular boundary. This term here, which comes from small fluctuations, the quadratic fluctuations around the circular boundary. And also we've have this term here, which is E to the S naught. This comes from that topological uh, term in the action. Uh, which is S, the action is S naught times the Euler character of the manifold. The disk has Euler character one. So we have E to the one times S naught. Um, so um, so this, is, this is the exact answer for this partition function integrating over all these disk topologies. So from that partition function, you can do lots of things. You can look at thermodynamic properties or whatever. What we're gonna do right now is we're gonna say, what's the density of states uh, that gives us partition function? So we take our function for Z of beta that we had just found. Um, and we say that it's equal to integral dE, some density of states rho naught of E uh, times E to the minus beta E. And from that, you can just inverse Laplace transform and find this function here, rho of E. So yes, question. Yeah. Um, does this technique that you're using here, is this unique to JT gravity or does it work for any other model of Dilaton gravity? Um, this uh, technique of, uh, well, so one thing that's tricky about these other models of Dilaton gravity, well, so JT gravity, the special fact that the, the curvature is constant and negative. Um, so you don't have that, then it's sort of more difficult to study. And I don't really know if there's sort of other models of dilaton gravity that can be studied so like exactly. Um, the one loop exactness is not something you would expect in any other model. Yeah, I think this is special. Yeah, okay. um, maybe there's some, maybe you. there's some other models that are related to JD gravity where this is true. But um, this is definitely this one loop exactness. Yeah, I wish I'd emphasize this is a very special thing in like say higher dimensional gravity. We don't in general expect things like this to to happen. Um, so, and it's really, it's, it's part of why JT gravity is a nice, simple toy model that we're going to be able to say lots about. Um, so this, this density of states of JT gravity, some interesting features. So at, let's just look at first at high energies. High energies, the density of states goes as e to the 2 pi square root of 2e plus s naught. So just because the partition function was multiplied by this factor e to the s naught, uh, this just comes along for the ride. And so this is supposed to be the entropy the S of E. It looks like S naught, which is a large number, plus the square root of E at high energies. So for low energies though, we look at this uh, cinch of root E and for small energies, we can just treat this as linear. So it looks like square root of E times E to the S naught at small uh, energies. 
So the square root is actually uh, somewhat reminiscent of the semicircle uh, that we saw in the GUE random matrix theory. For the GUE, we found that the average density of states was the semicircle. And if you look at the edge of the semicircle, it behaves like a square root. So you can draw real quick. The square root the, in the, the semicircle and this cinch thing would look pretty similar near the edge and then they deviated higher energies. So this, this fact that the JT gravity has this square root behavior near the edge, which is turns out to be a hallmark of these random matrix theories, is going to be a key fact for our uh, next lecture. So um, this disk gives a continuous uh, density of states. It doesn't see that JT gravity has a discrete spectrum. Um, so consequently, if you would take this disk uh, answer and we compute the spectral form factor, it gives a decaying slope. So the spectral form factor is Z of beta plus IT, Z of beta minus IT. We can take two copies of this answer we got for the disk, uh, multiply them, and we find this thing here. So there's this one loop term, they combine for the two copies into this. Uh, this is one over square root of beta squared plus T squared cubed. Um, and then there's this thing up here from the, the actions. And then it's all multiplied by E to the two S naught. So this thing decays uh, in time. And for a large time, it actually decays as a power of uh, one over T to the three halves because of this term here. So it's, it's a slow decay, but it nonetheless is a decay. Um, so these two disks are not giving us the ramp or the plateau. Um, and they're giving us a continuous density of states. So to understand, um, how the uh, ramp comes about, it's actually useful to think about uh, this uh, decay when it's coming from a little bit more physically. Um, so we're gonna take a, we're gonna look at this spectral form factor and think about it in a bit more of a Hilbert space uh, picture. So let's start with this thermal field double state, which I've defined here. Thermal field double state is an entangled state of two systems and it's labeled by uh, inverse temperature beta. So here, if we have a system which we call left and, and another copy of the system which we call right, the thermal field double is a nice entangled state uh, where these are the energy eigenstates of the two copies of the system. And we weighted uh, this product of energy eigenstates by e to the minus beta over two times the energy. Um, so one thing about this, this in thermal field double state is that it's naturally uh, computed uh, naturally related to computations in the path integral. Um, so here I've drawn a little picture of, of what the path integral uh, that computes uh, this, the wave function of the state is. So let's say we want to, we're interested in this thermal field double state, uh, the wave function in some basis phi left, phi right, where phi left and phi right are the values of the fields and the left copy of the system and the right copy of the system. So this thermal field double state turns out to be computed by this simple path integral, which, was, which is where you integrate over, uh, uh, you, have a, you have a path integral where uh, Euclidean time uh, runs from zero to beta over two. And the values of the fields at Euclidean time zero are phi left. And the values of the fields at Euclidean time beta over two are phi right. So there's a nice simple path integral in the picture here. So here the circles sort of represent the spatial slices of the system. And this direction is Euclidean time. So this path integral uh, on this uh, Euclidean time interval computes this wave function. Um, another important property about this thermal field double state is that it has a nice symmetry, uh, satisfies H left equals H right, so that it's invariant under translating in time uh, in one direction on the left and the opposite direction on the right. So, uh, so far I've said what this, I've defined abstractly this thermal field double state. I've said that it's nice in terms of the path integral. Um, and then one other fact is that if we take the norm of this state and you work it out, uh, you find that it's equal to Z of beta, the partition function. Um, and there's a nice path integral way of thinking about that. So we take two of these path integrals computing the thermal field double state wave functions. And we glue them together by integrating over the value of fields here and here. 
This just gives us a totally periodic path integral with Euclidean time periodic and beta. And that's the partition function. So this, this gluing of two thermal field double states to make the partition function, uh, it's a simple picture in the path integral and we're gonna take advantage of that. So this thermal field double state plays a special role in gravity. Um, we can think about this state as the state at time equals zero of the two-sided eternal ADS black hole. Um, so here I've drawn the Penrose diagram of the two-sided ADS Schwarzschild geometry. Uh, and there's, I've drawn the time equals zero slice in red. So the state on this slice is the thermal field double state. This is uh, realized by Maldacena back in the 2000s. Um, so in the path integral in gravity, uh, we can prepare the state on this left slice. We can say what's the weight, we can prepare the wave function of this red slice by doing a, a path integral where we have an asymptotic boundary of length beta over two, and we fix the geometry on some spatial slice uh, that connects the two asymptotic boundaries left and right. So here, this red slice is, is uh, uh, supposed to be this spatial slice of thermal field double. And my claim is that if you, if you, uh, you fix the values of the fields on this red slice in this geometry, uh, and you integrate over all things here with this asymptotic boundary like beta over two fixed values here. This gives the wave function on this for this uh, uh, black hole. Um, so that's a bit abstract, but yeah. Um, here you you just have JT gravity, not actual Einstein gravity. So how do you know that this thermal field double state will have anything to do with a black hole? Oh, um, so maybe I should be more clear. This, this statement about the thermal field double uh, describing this two-sided black hole, this we believe to be true for uh, in general in ADS CFT. So here the, the thermal field double is a, is a state from two copies of the system. So we can think about this as two CFTs, one on the left and one on the right. And in the bulk using ADS CFT, we think that this, AD, this thermal field double state is the state of a two-sided black hole connecting the left boundary and the right boundary. Okay, I so might have missed something, but when did we invoke ADS CFT? I thought we were just studying JT gravity. Um, so yeah, sorry, maybe I should be clear. So, so we were studying JT gravity up until this point. Um, now let's forget about JT gravity for a moment. And I'm gonna tell you a general fact about ADS CFT. Okay, okay. Um, which is that this, if you take this thermal field double state, uh, where the two systems in the thermal field double state are two uh, copies of the CFT in ADS CFT. The ADS CFT dictionary is telling us that the bulk description of that state is this two sided ADS black hole. And so notice that here the, the two CFTs are not coupled, um, they're in an entangled state, however. And so the sort of the connectedness of this uh, bulk geometry, the fact that the black hole has two sides. Is related to the entanglement of this uh, of this thermal field double state, and then furthermore, uh, this the wave function of this thermal field double state. I told you how to compute it, sort of just generally in quantum mechanics using a path integral like this, but in gravity, uh, the bulk state, its wave function can be computed using this sort of picture, where the boundary is has a uh, length beta over two, but we integrate over whatever's going on in the bulk here. So I'm going to tell you now how this does work specifically in JT gravity. Um, I have a question. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the thermal field double, you've, de you've described some eigenstates of some Hamiltonian. I'm assuming this Hamiltonian is uh, maximally chaotic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So we're, yeah, we should think about uh, uh, these eigenstates as so for, as an example, you can take n equals four super Yang mills. And it's got eigenstates E uh, and we take two copies of n equals four super Yang mills. And we can make this thermal field double state for that uh, for two copies of the system. And then in the bulk, it's dual to two B string theory and uh, a state in that string theory is the state of this two sided black hole. And we, the claim is that that state is the is dual to the thermal field double of the n equals four. Uh, 
super game modes. Um, so in JT gravity, it's uh, somewhat easy to deal with uh, this, this wave function uh, and the path integral which produces it. Uh, so first we wanna say, okay, so our, our goal is to say, uh, is to talk about the, the wave function of this two-sided black hole in JT gravity. So here I've written, I've drawn the Penrose diagram for uh, the two-sided black hole in two-dimensional uh, ADS gravity. Uh, and I, I haven't drawn a singularity, maybe I should draw a singularity, but just to really there's, there's we don't really know if there's a, in JT gravity, there's not really a singularity because the metric is constant negative curvature. Um, but just so to make things more familiar, I'll draw a fake singularity. Uh, so we wanna talk about this, this state, the uh, two-sided black hole time equals zero state, which lives on a, on a slice here, which I've drawn in red. And we wanna describe that state in some basis. So we can calculate its wave function. So a nice wave function for uh, JT gravity, sorry, a nice basis for JT gravity um, is states where we fix the metric along uh, a, a, a slice of zero extrinsic curvature. So the states of uh, fixed metric, uh, it's the symmetric on a line, the only different morphism invariant uh, property of that is, the, is just the overall length. So we can think of a basis of states in JT gravity as just the states with, uh, on, with uh, a spatial slice of length uh, L and the spatial slice of zero extrinsic curvature. Um, so then in this basis, we can calculate the wave function of the thermal field double state. It'll be a function of the length of this, this line here. Um, and so as I comment, I told you it has uh, this, this spatial slice as length L, but it's going out from these two asymptotic boundaries. Really, we should be careful to regularize the length of this, this uh, spatial slice. And there's a, it turns out to be a nice way to deal with that. And so it's, you, we can easily uh, talk about the renormalized length of this spatial slice. So this thermal field double state, we can talk about its wave function in this length basis. It'll be a function of the length. And the JT gravity version of the thing I said in the previous slide is that this wave function is computed by the path integral over geometries where there's a uh, Euclidean boundary of length beta over two. There's a geodesic, there's a zero extrinsic curvature spatial slice of length L, or normalized length L between these, these uh, two boundaries. And we integrate over all geometries in the middle here. So this is the path integral picture for this, this, uh, uh, this wave function. So one thing we're gonna be interested in is what happens if we take this thermal field double state and evolve it with uh, uh, upwards in time on the left and upwards in time on the right. Let's say both by time T on the left and right. So here we take this thermal field double state on the time equals zero slice. We evolve it to get a state on the purple slice, uh, which is this state. And then let's ask about the wave function of this time evolved state in the length basis. So we can calculate this wave function again with a path integral. So here's a path integral which prepares the state on the red slice. This is a path integral over Euclidean geometries with this, with this Euclidean time boundary. But then when we evolve in time, we integrate over Lorentzian geometries, which have time going upwards on the boundary. And then uh, we integrate over, so we integrate over these Lorentzian geometries uh, up to a slice of length L on this purple slice. So this should give, uh, maybe I'll write it explicitly, uh, this thing should be equal to uh, this thing here. So the behavior of this wave function is, is going to be important. Um, so the, this two-sided black hole, uh, this, we call it the, the connected part of this, this, the spatial slice of this two-sided black hole in Einstein-Rosen bridge. It goes from one asymptotic boundary to the other, and it goes through the horizon of the left black hole all the way to the other. Um, so maybe I should look at this slice. So we can look at these, these uh, 
spatial slices, uh, the red and the purple. And we can see that the purple one uh, goes, uh, the horizon on the left is here, the horizon on the right is here. And so there's some distance in between the two horizons. And we can see that as, as we go up in time, we evolve the pur this purple slice upwards, the length between these two boundaries should probably increase. Uh, so it turns out that the length of this Einstein-Rosen bridge, uh, so the, the wormhole between these, uh, in this, in this two-sided black hole, increases linearly in time. Um, so if you just look at the classical ADS uh, short-style geometry, you find the length of these uh, zero extrinsic curvature slices grows linearly in time. And that's reflected in these wave functions, which we're computing um, as follows. So we can draw the time equals zero wave function in the, as a function of the length, uh, like this, has some peak at some order one value of length. So that's uh, here, the, the length in between the two horizons is zero, but there's, if you define the renormalized length, you might have some sort of one uh, leftover length corresponding to what's out here. As you evolve in time, the wave function is peaked around a larger and larger value of the length. And the value it's peaked around is proportional to the time you've evolved by. So the wave function on the purple slice, it's a function of L, and has small amplitude to, to have a short, a short length, has a large amplitude to have a long length. So now let's get back to the spectral form factor. So if we take this time evolved state, this time evolved thermal field double state, and we take the overlap with the thermal field double at time zero, this turns out to be the, uh, this analytically continued partition function, which we're interested in. So we can think about this using the path integral like this. So we can draw the, the path integral, which prepares this time evolved state. It has a piece of Lorentzian, of Euclidean boundary of length beta over two. It has some, uh, Lorentzian boundary, here I've evolved by only by t over two, and we'll see why in a moment. So this creates the time evolved state on this purple slice. And then we take the overlap with the time equals zero state by gluing together these two slices. So when we glue, we integrate over all these geometries with these boundary lengths. So there's a segment of beta over two, t over two, beta over two, and t over two. So altogether, that means the boundary has a length which has a, uh, a piece of, that's Euclidean of length beta and a piece that's Lorentzian of length t. So that's precisely the path integral, which would give something like this. So this gives a physical picture of why the z of beta plus it decays in time. It decays in time because we're taking the overlap of this time evolved state, which has a long einstein rosen bridge, with the, the t equals zero state, which has a short einstein rosen bridge. So basically we're looking at the overlap of this red state and this purple state, and it's small as the, as the purple state has evolved longer and longer in time. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. Does it matter that the Lorentzian and Euclidean time evolutions are interleaved? They do half of one and then half the other. Yeah, so this is a, um, I, I unfortunately haven't kind of talked about it too much, but it, so it's, it's it it doesn't so the you could change the you can think about this this uh, boundary as described by some contour in imaginary time so you take the imaginary time plane of um, it's got a real axis and an imaginary axis and we're moving we're we have a we're considering a periodic path in this uh, uh, plane and different choices of periodic path correspond to different like ways of segmenting up the boundary the Euclidean or Lorentzian or possibly complexified time. Um, turns out the answer is, is independent of, of how you uh, uh, choose this, this, this uh, time curve. It only depends on the overall length. Um, so there are no poles you can deform? At no, not, not in this case. Um, okay. it's, you can think about it as it's because we're, we're uh, actually, it's, it's, it's maybe as important if I should mention it. I'm gonna make a little new slide real quick. Uh, so what we're doing is we're, we're looking at trace, uh, looking at trace e to the minus beta plus i t h. And to turn it, you can think about it as to turn it into a path integral. What you do is you partition this 
thing up into little bits, e to the uh, epsilon h times, uh, you could, one way of doing this is, is thinking about this as a product of terms, e to the epsilon h beta plus it. And you take a bunch of these, uh, say let epsilon is one over, one over n, and we take a product of uh, these up to n, and that'll give us this exponential here. We could also partition it up in different ways. We can think about this as a product of little epsilon h beta, uh, where if you take a bunch of products of these, it'll make e to the minus beta h. And then times another uh, piece, which is e to the minus epsilon h times it. So uh, we can think about partitioning this exponential up into parts which are purely uh, Euclidean evolution and purely Lorentzian evolution. And we get the path integral by, by inserting complete sets of states in between each of these little partitions. Um, and because there's all these different ways of partitioning up the exponential, we can get different path integrals, um, but they're all gonna give the same answer. Very good, thank you. Um, so finally, let's get back to the, we talked about Z of beta plus IT. Let's get back to the actual spectral form factor, just, just taking the modulus of that squared. So this is the probability. It's the probability of the thermal field double state to be time evolved and then return to the initial state. So we've seen that these, uh, this disk contribution to Z of beta should give a decaying answer to the spectral form factor. So they're not gonna give the ramp and the plateau, but so these ramp and plateau, they're non-decaying. They, they, the ramp, in fact, increases as time goes up. Uh, the plateau stays constant. Um, so what does this mean? This means that there has to be something in gravity that gives us a non-decaying uh, probability for the thermal field double state, which is, likes to increase its length, to end back at a short length state. Um, Furthermore, we expect that the answer for a fixed system is a noisy function where maybe you average out to get the, the average ramp and plateau. So here, Z of beta plus IT, we expect to be a noisy function and the noise should average to zero. But uh, the spectral form factor Z of beta plus IT is the square of this noise. And we can think about it as having an average piece or just the ramp plus a, a different noisy peak, which averages to zero, just this noise squared minus the ramp. So um, in gravity, it's going to be really difficult to try to understand this noise. The noise will depend on the precise details of the energy levels of the system. Um, and so it's, it's tough to see something like that showing up in JD gravity, which is this very simple model. And in fact, we'll see that we don't find the noise, um, but we're gonna, find a, we're gonna find a ramp momentarily. And uh, as we're going through this, I want you to keep in the back of your heads that this ramp here, it's something which shows up when we compute two copies of the spectral form factor. It doesn't show up when we compute one copy and then square it. So it's sort of something that shows up sort of intrinsically in this two copies of the system calculation, not in the square of the one copy thing. So that's sort of odd, but in gravity, it sort of has a natural interpretation. Um, Can I ask a question? We'll see. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're going to address it later in that case, just wait. Um, I understand why the, the slope is uh, gen generalizes to higher dimensions because the, the yeah, because, because the, this, the- This length growing always happens. Yeah, yeah the, the warm up grows also in higher dimensions, but is the ramp and the, and the plateau also something that we should expect in higher dimensions or in different theories of gravity, or is it something that is really yeah. due to JT gravity? So we expect them both in higher dimensional gravity. So in, for the ramp, we will give an explanation or a possible explanation for it in a moment um, that also works in higher dimensions. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll get back to that. But for the, just for now, it's true that we do expect the ramp and plateau in JT gravity and higher dimensional gravity because higher dimensional gravity is also chaotic and should have this random matrix level statistics. So just a, a quick side note, just uh, uh, 
about this decaying thing. So we're, we're sort of looking for a rampant plateau because of this random matrix universality. But even if you didn't have that, um, the spectral form factor can't decay forever. If you have a, a, a finite dimensional Hilbert space or discrete spectrum. That's because uh, if you just look at the, the time average of the spectral form factor over infinite time, if it decayed forever, the average over infinite time is zero because for, for almost all the time, it's, it's, it's decayed to zero. But if you just write out the spectral form factor in terms of just sum over discrete states and you work out the time average, it's exponentially small compared to the spectral form factor. This had a sum over two energies. This has a sum over one. It turns out this restricts the sum over energies from two to one. Um, so you find a small answer, but it's not zero. This is just a, a side comment to, um, to emphasize that even without this random matrix stuff, uh, we'd still be expecting some sort of non-decaying thing uh, in a spectral form factor. Okay, so now finally to the ramp. Uh, what we've done is we've looked at all the, we've integrated over all these boundary curves. That sums up every contribution for the disk topology contribution to the spectral form factor. So it may be that JT gravity, uh, it could have been that JT gravity uh, just didn't have a ramp, uh, in which case it would be sort of hard to understand in terms of uh, discrete spectrum and quantum chaos. Um, it turns out it does have a ramp and to understand it, we have to look at other topologies because we've already exhausted the disk topology. Um, so the ramp comes from, instead of having each asymptotic boundary uh, be part of a disk, two decoupled disks, we consider a, all the geometries which are cylindrical topologically, where there's one asymptotic boundary here and another asymptotic boundary here, and they're connected by this, this cylinder. So this is sort of a natural candidate for the ramp because it appears when we have two copies of Z of beta, not when we have one and then square it. So this is like the ramp, something that shows up when you consider two copies of the system. Um, also, the Euler character of this cylinder is zero. So in JT gravity, it's topological weight, it's e to the s naught times zero. Um, so that's like L to the zero, because L is the e to the entropy. And in random matrix theory, we found that the ramp is T over beta, times L to the zero. It didn't come up with a, with a factor of L. So the like weight in terms of the entropy of the cylinder looks right. This fact that it only appears in the square looks good. So let's try to compute this, uh, uh, this cylinder. Um, and just as for some terminology, the cylinder is an example of what's called a space-time wormhole. Uh, connects with space-time wormhole connects distant regions of space-time. Um, for example, even these two asymptotic boundaries connected by this space time wormhole. So um, we're not gonna go into as much detail into this computation because some of the, the, the basic ideas are not so different from the disk computation. Um, so first, I've just given you the metric for one of these cylindrical geometries uh, that has constant negative curvature. Because remember in JT gravity, we only integrate over geometries which have constant negative curvature. They're allowed to have this, this wiggly boundary this, what, uh, this wiggly cutoff boundary, but inside uh, it has to be just constant negative curvature. So the cylinders, they have uh, a parameter called B and B is the length of a circular geodesic right in the middle of this, this cylinder. Um, and here I've drawn, we can think about the cylinder as a quotient of the hyperbolic disk. If you cut along these orange lines, which are geodesics and identify them, you get a cylinder. So under its identification, this geodesic here becomes the circular one here. And these wiggly boundaries uh, out near the asymptotic boundary become the red thing and the purple thing. Um, so as in the case of the disk, to include this contribution in JT gravity, this would be a contribution to Z of beta times Z of beta prime. We have to integrate over the shape of these boundary curves, the red and purple boundaries. We also have to integrate over B, the size of this circle. Um, and there's a way to think about doing this integral, which will be useful tomorrow, especially. Uh, especially. It's also somewhat useful for uh, what we're talking about now. We think of fixing the length B of this circle 
and cutting the geometry along this circle to cut it into two parts. So there's a piece with the red wiggly boundary, length beta, um, and it's a cylinder which has also has this circular B boundary, which is a geodesic, zero extrinsic curvature. And then we have another one for this, this uh, purple boundary. And then to, to look at the full contribution of all the cylinders, we integrate over the size of B and also the twist uh, tau of how you twist the two, uh, these are called, we'll call these trumpets. You twist the two trumpets relative to each other before gluing them. So it turns out that, and we'll maybe say some words about how to justify this tomorrow. This is the measure for integrating over this twist and the size B. The twist you integrate from zero to two pi B. So it's not, you're, you're not integrating uh, zero to two pi like an angle. You're integrating over the, the length you twist by, which is uh, the length of this circle is two pi B. Um, or here I've defined B to be like the radius. Uh, and then you also integrate over B from zero to infinity. So the, these functions here, this, these, if you compute the path integral for this, it's independent of this twist. So you can just integrate out the twist and you find uh, a measure which is uh, BDB, missing a factor of two pi, but whatever. Um, and so you can think about, uh, uh, so yeah, just to summarize, you can think about integrating the cylinder as integrating over these two trumpets, uh, with the measure BDB. Um, and then if you work it out, uh, I won't go through it explicitly, you can, and you continue beta, uh, goes to beta plus or minus IT, you get precisely this ramp answer that we expected for sufficiently long times. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated at short times, but it quickly turns into just this nice formula. Um, and so why do we get a linear function of T? The wormhole gives a natural answer, which is that it's the T ways to twist the boundaries relative to each other. So each asymptotic boundary will have a length, which for large T goes as T. So beta is small compared to T. So we have a, a boundary of length T on the left, a boundary of length T on the right. And when we integrate over these, these uh, wormholes, we integrate over the ways in which the left and right time are twisted relative to each other. And you can think of it as there's sort of T ways to twist the, the, the two boundaries. Um, and that gives us this linear factor of T. So um, notice that this is, this is pretty different than how we saw this linear factor of T in the random matrix theory case. That, in that case, it came from this spectral rigidity, this one over delta E squared uh, repulsion between eigenvalues that came from the Vandermont. So there we thought about it in energy space um, and it really told us about uh, this propulsion between eigenvalues. Here it doesn't, we found it in this neat way um, working just in this, this uh, spectral form factor, uh, not in an energy quantity. Um, this slide I'm gonna skip, it's not very important. Uh, and so I'll briefly talk about question. the, yeah. Um. So you just uh, mentioned that this came from this um, uh, repulsion of eigenvalues, um, mm -hmm. from the random matrix theory example that we talked about yesterday. Um, and I was just curious, can you interpret this in a similar way, um, even though it didn't arise in that way? Um, here, like you yeah. said, the twist, I mean, but can we kind of come up with an interpretation that's similar to that um, for these two uh, CFTs on each side of this? Yeah, so maybe we'll talk about it a little bit more tomorrow, but um, basically, so we've ca calculated the spectral form factor. We can use that spectral form factor to you like do Laplace transform, Fourier transform to get the, what you would think is the pair correlation function of the, of the densities. And this ramp would say that the pair correlation function has this piece, which is the one over E minus E prime squared. So this is telling us that these duals to JT gravity should have this eigenvalue repulsion, but it's not really telling us sort of, there's still some mysterious factors. We don't have a picture of sort of what are the things making up the discrete energies in JT gravity. We'll get to that a little bit more tomorrow. Thank you. Um, okay, so quickly, I'm gonna give you an interpretation of sort of along the lines of what we talked about with the slope of why is the ramp growing in time? So 
these space-time wormholes, of which the, this cylinder is an example, we can think about them as processes involving the absorption and emission of closed baby universes. So in GT gravity, closed universes are circles. Um, and we can think of a nice basis for closed universes as the uni closed universes that are circles of fixed length, zero extrinsic of curvature. So let's label these states B, where B is the length of this closed universe. So these trumpet things that I've drawn, they look like path integrals where there's an external baby universe state, B. And so here I've drawn an example of another path integral um, with an external baby universe. This is uh, the amplitude for one of our two-sided black holes of length L to evolve in time, end up at a on this uh, to at a two-sided black hole with length L prime, but also to have emitted a baby universe of size P. So if we integrate over all these geometries where these we have these boundary conditions, we can interpret this this quantity as this uh, transition amplitude. So it's a transition amplitude between a black hole and a black hole plus a baby universe. And due to the topology, the cylindrical topology, uh, this sort of process where we include a baby universe being emitted is exponentially suppressed, e to the minus s naught, relative to the uh, contribution where we don't, which is this, just a disk, uh, disk topology. So there's a small amplitude to emit a closed universe. Um, but uh, we, we'll see that it has an important effect. Basically, it's this. So what we're doing is we're looking at this time evolved thermal field double state. We evolve it for a long time so that its length on the purple slice is, likes to be very large. But what if we allow it to emit a baby universe of size B? Well, it turns out if B is of order T, so this, if, the, if the baby universe is very large, uh, the purple slice has an amplitude, uh, has an amplitude to be small. Uh, so here I've drawn a, a, a little picture of sort of the picture, uh, I've drawn a picture of, of what's sort of happening um, is you start out with a really long spatial slice, a long uh, Einstein-Rosen bridge. And uh, when the baby universe splits off, it can turn into a short uh, baby universe with an order one length and a long, uh, a large baby universe size uh, T. So um, altogether, if you look at this process here, you start, you create the thermal field double state, you evolve so it gets really long, you emit a baby universe of size T, then the uh, Einstein-Rosen bridge shortens, becomes short, and then you take the overlap with the thermal field double state. This overlap is now allowed to be non-decaying because this, this length is short uh, and this length is short, so this gives a large overlap. The only thing that makes it small is the fact that this topology has changed. So it's, it doesn't decay in time, but it's small because of the topology. So we're not in JT gravity, sort of the rule, the natural rules don't allow us to allow, uh, have these external baby universe things. So if we're calculating Z of beta plus IT and we said we're allowed to emit a baby universe, we'd also have to specify its state, like what's its wave function in B, and that sort of isn't part of the computation of our addition function. Um, but what we are allowed to do is if we calculate z of beta plus it, z of beta minus it, we could have this system on the left emit a closed universe, which is then absorbed by the system on the right. So there's no external baby universe state. And then because this baby universe has size t, uh, if we integrate over the different ways in which this baby universe can rotate while being traded, there's sort of T ways for it to rotate. That's related to this measure BDB for B. Uh, it's proportional to B, the size of the universe, which is T. So this cylinder, which gives the ramp, to summarize, the way in which it does it is that uh, this, it, emission, emitting this closed universe, which is large as a size T, is able to take away all the length of this long Einstein-Rosen bridge and bring it back to being like the time equals zero Einstein-Rosen bridge. Um, so you have mm -hmm. five minutes. Oh, five minutes. Cool. Okay. I'm just about done. Maybe I have uh, uh, two slides. Yeah. So, uh, so I'll briefly talk about um, how to talk, how, how this generalizes to higher dimensions. So the way in which we explain this plateau, let's say this ramp and cylinder 
in JT Gravity, um, I use these sort of complicated geometries. I talked about these geometries that have piecewise Euclidean and Lorentzian parts, and I talked about these baby universes. And it's hard to deal with these sorts of geometries more generally. Um, another fact, which I didn't really talk about, is that the path integral over these geometries, it doesn't have a saddle point. So there's no classical solution. The reason is that the integral over B likes to has a runaway direction towards small b. Um, so b is proportional to t, but there's a there's a constant uh, multiplying t, and you can think about that constant as related to the overall energy of the system. But because we're in the canonical ensemble, we integrate over the energy with fixed temperature. So a way to solve that and make a, a JT gravity in the cylinder have a saddle point is to not consider z of beta plus it, but a different quantity, which is like a microcanonical version. You fix the energy instead of the temperature. It turns out in that case, the integral over b has a saddle point. So the whole integral over the cylinder has a saddle point. Two circular asymptotic boundaries and a b of size t that's set by, with a coefficient set by the energy. So this quantity, this y, instead of z, uh, this, this is like you can make, consider a microcanonical spectral form factor. It's a little bit better to generalize. Um, and you can think about actually that the saddle point for this quantity, you're integrating over beta. Beta has a saddle point at zero. In, in the spectral form factors of the beta for the left, beta for the right, they're both equal to zero. So the geometries that give the saddle point have a purely, purely Lorentzian time. Um, so the cylindrical saddle points that give this fixed energy spectral form factor, they're cylinders with two periodic Lorentzian boundaries. So it's easy to generalize what happens in JT gravity to higher dimensions because there's, a net, there's this natural generalization of the geometry. Um, so here I've drawn the Penrose diagram for the two-sided eternal black hole. There's a time translation symmetry where time goes up on the left and right on the, on, uh, up on the right and down on the left. And what we're going to do to construct the cylinder geometry is we're going to take a constant time slice, or here a constant time slice, evolve for some time t, find another slice, and then identify those two slices. That makes a cylindrical geometry with a sort of a, a singular tip, cone tip, but the boundary has a length t. Now, in JT gravity, uh, if you look at how the path integral works, it, this it's natural to sort of deform this geometry in a complex direction near the tip of the cone uh, that actually makes this topologically cylindrical um, and uh, non-singular. Non and that method turns out to easily generalize to higher dimensions so that this quote unquote cylindrical geometry, which is called the double cone, um, always exists. It's a piece of just the black hole geometry that we're familiar with, it's just this periodic piece. And it gives the ramp through uh, these relative time translations of the two boundaries. Um, and then just the last comment I'm going to make is that this ramp was telling us about these overlaps between a state which has evolved for a long amount of time, has a large length, it can have an overlap with a state of a short length. This has a sort of more uh, a conventional Hilbert space picture as follows. Uh, we started with the thermal field double state and we evolved with a chaotic Hamiltonian. And we can think about that as roughly randomizing the state. So Z of beta plus IT is like the overlap of this randomized state with the initial state. It's not quite a hard random state if you know those words, but it's a quote unquote random state. And overlaps between random states in a large Hilbert space are typically small, but if the Hilbert space has finite dimension, the overlap is finite. So this, uh, fact that we're seeing that the ramp has to do with these overlaps of, um, of very different looking states, these non-perturbatively small uh, overlaps of states uh, is related to this fact in sort of the boundary picture. Uh, okay, so that, that's it. I'm just gonna leave these uh, questions up um, for tomorrow because uh, that's it for what I have to say today. Thank you. All right. Very good. Questions for Phil? I have a verification pause.
Uh, I might have missed something, but it seemed to me that in the in the double trumpet feature in JT Gravity, you have two partition functions where each partition function involves two boundaries. And so you have to look for boundaries, right? Oh, By sorry, let me go up to uh, the picture just to make sure. This picture here, so each one has this, this boundary here? Is that what you mean? Yeah, because uh, later when you connected the two, uh, the two complex geometries, it seemed to mm -hmm. me that you had a thermofield double on the left, a thermofield double on the right, and you were connected them through a, a... I I see what you mean. So maybe let me let me try to make sure I uh, I understand what you mean. So let's uh, let's look at this picture. Uh, and so here I have a z of beta on the left and a z of beta on the right. But if so, if you sort of like try to think about cutting this, this is like a, the overlap with a the thermal field double on the left with itself. And there's another thermal field double on the right. So each of these things is like a copy of the system. Is that sort of what you mean? Yeah, uh, and I think there was a picture later, a couple of slides oh. down. Where, where, oh, where oh, 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 this, this picture, this picture. Yeah, that picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was a little confused by this. Like here, you're considering actually two asymptotic boundary or four asymptotic boundaries. So uh, maybe it's, it's a, I'm not sure if there's a, there's a, there's a bit of a terminology confusion, which is that in this, this quantity is Z of beta plus IT, there's like one asymptotic boundary that's periodic, but we can slice it so that a slice has two. So it's because the sort of boundaries, it, it's, it's the same thing in that in the, this hartle Hawking, this, sorry, this thermal field double state, it's a state of two boundaries, but they're connected by the path integral via one boundary. So, um, the special property of this thermal field double state that the boundaries will, yeah, the boundaries are simply connected by this segment. Uh, even though when we slice, we can think about them as, as two copies of the system. Yeah, so it is. I'm having a slightly hard time to connect this to the picture you had later, or also before, where you actually have a worm, like in Lorenzo, you just have a. a Oh, no, this, this double trumpet. I would expect, yeah, I would expect that to be um, the Lorentzian evolution of a slice of one of the two sides, not, not yeah. the whole picture above, right? That's a good question. Yeah, I, so I don't think there's a, it's so this picture here, okay, maybe let me say this. So what we've done is we, we worked at fixed energy and then the saddle point is at beta equals zero. So we can try to do that to this picture and let's see what happens. So beta is like the length of this segment here and the length of this segment here. So what's sort of going on is you can think of uh, this, uh, uh, well, I'll say first, so first there's that. The second thing is that in this, the middle of this geometry here, it's a complex or Euclidean geometry. Um, so what we do when we consider this fixed energy thing is we're gonna send the length of this segment and the length of this segment, also these ones, to zero, so that these two things are now touching, these two points. Um, these two points are now touching. So it's sort of like a... Not a natural thing to do for in this point of view of the geometry. Um, so it's, it's a, yeah, it's a little confusing to interpret, but you could instead think about uh, First, so yeah, I, I think it's, it's confusing and I don't have a good picture of how to connect this Lorentzian double cone to this uh, complexified uh, picture of the baby universes, except for that in general, it's actually more natural to consider in some ways uh, a version of this double cone, which is complexified in the bulk here. And it's a little bit complicated. I don't have time to go into much detail, but let's say, here's a quick way to say it is that as we're going inwards, uh, this is decreasing R. And the, what we want to think about is metrics that are related to this, just by a change of coordinates, where we take R to be complex as we go near R equals zero. And if we complexify R, it's, we get a metric which is uh, not Lorentzian, it's now a complex metric. But instead of this cone tip thing here, we have something that's more like this B circle here. So, the, 
uh, by complexifying these metrics, just using complex coordinates, uh, you can sort of go back and forth between these two pictures. Uh, but the question you were asking specifically about how to think about slicing this thing so that there's sort of a thermal field double here and a thermal field double here. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I don't have a particularly good picture about this fixed energy version of that, besides saying start with the fixed temperature version and then fix the energy. There's a, a picture for the fixed temperature and then you can fix the energy. Um, Perfect. That's great. Thank you. So, actually, sorry, maybe I'll just make one last comment about it, which is that, like, so we've prepared this state on this slice with a path integral of length beta. And when we fix the energy, you can think about just forgetting about this path integral preparation state. You just have a black hole of some energy and you evolve in time and then take the overlap of the black hole with some with that energy. So there's like a physical picture of just evolving a black hole of fixed energy instead of fixed temperature. And you can have the same closed universe thing happening. Um, yeah. Actually, let me ask a follow up to that. When you, when you say that you start complexifying the metric when you go in in mm -hmm. R, is there some finite R where that happens? The imaginary part is sort of zero and then it picks up some value at some finite R. Yeah, you're free to choose different contours. So like, let's say we consider the complex R plane. There's R equals zero is this singular cone point. And you want mm -hmm. R to go to plus to, to, to the real axis at infinity so that the boundary conditions are satisfied. But so in between in the R is minus infinity and infinity, um, you're allowed to go between those through any contour that doesn't hit the R equals zero point. So it can, it can deviate away from being real anywhere along the way. Um, and the answer and you get is sort of and computationally, it's convenient to choose a kinky contour. Yeah, um, computationally, it is. Yeah. OK, great. Thanks. So Christian? Um, so my question is, um, I'm just tr sort of trying to think about like this in, in terms of um, uh, thermalization of a perturbation to a black hole horizon. And um, I guess the way that I'm thinking about it is that if you consider the the thermal two point function in the Heisenberg picture, um, you can sort of write, write it down in such a way that you sort of get the spectral, spectral form factor, at least that sort of phase combination that you use. Um, yeah, yeah. And you, then you sort of strip off the matrix elements. Uh -huh. And then that more or less is the spectral form factor. Um, so in some sense, I sort of see that as like describing the, thermalization behavior of the black hole horizon after it's perturbed. Yeah. Um, so how, what does the plat, what, what does a ramp and plateau mean for the actual like thermalization horizon? Um, okay, so let's, so first I'll talk about, so, okay. To connect to what I was saying a little bit more simply, um, let me tell you first this, uh, so the, the, thermal two-point function that you're asking about. It's neatly related by like analytic continuation. I'm just gonna scroll down to a free page uh, to, uh, to the two-point function. I'm gonna draw a picture in the Penrose diagram of, of that two-point function. It's, you have an operator here and you have an operator here. Uh, this is related by analytic continu continuation to uh, a two-point function where you put one of the operators on the left-hand side. So they're separated in time by uh, uh, a time t. So these are separated by time t. And here they're separated in the left. And the, the left and right ones are separated by time t and on opposite boundaries. These are just related by t goes to t plus i beta over 2 in this two-point function. So they're, they're related, but they're physically different. So the first thing I'll do is tell you about how this thing works. And then I'll talk, tell you about how this thing works. This is a bit more simple to connect to what I was saying today. So the reason this thing, so this thing decays, this thing also decays in a very similar way. And the reason is that this two-point function is sort of measuring the, the distance between these two operators. Like the propagator in this geometry, O of on left, uh, O on the right, 
is sort of like e to the minus the mass times the geodesic distance between the two. And we've seen is that we evolve in time. The geodesic distance between these two things grows. So this propagator decays. Then this thing I said about the wormhole, uh, we can take that into account, which is that uh, in this two-point function, we ask uh, about what's happening to the two-point function as we evolve forwards in time. The length of the, of the uh, wormhole between the two sides grows, but then it can, sh it can shorten. It can shrink back to a short size by emitting one of these baby universes. So there's a picture I, um, along the lines of that. I, have a, I wrote a paper about this, if you're interested in more. Um, there's a, uh, that's sort of how it works for this uh, two-sided two-point function. Now, to go back to uh, this picture, uh, it turns out, maybe we'll say there's a second way to think about this. Um, basically, the, when you consider these, these wormhole geometries, um, the sort of physical interpretation is a bit murky because of basically diffeomorphism invariance lets you move around the wormholes in a lot of ways. So that sort of one gauge fixed choice of where to put the wormholes gives you one physical picture, a different way gives you a different physical picture. So the thing I just described is one physical picture. Another physical picture is that this left hand, this right hand side creates a particle and it's able to, it, a wormhole uh, creates a little shortcut between the two boundaries. And so the particle is near here through this wormhole, even though the einstein rosen bridge is not. So in this two-point function, the first picture is a little bit unclear, this shortening of the wormhole. But this second picture in terms of the wormhole creating a little shortcut in the space-time uh, is more clear. So basically, the, you throw a particle in the black hole. It would like to thermalize. It would like to go into the black hole and be gone forever. But a wormhole can appear which links that particle that you've thrown in out to the boundary again. So that's why it doesn't decay. So, so in that sense, could, could you sort of think of the horizon as sort of like this collection of wormholes? Well, I'm not really sure. Like, so it's like um, the wormholes have a very small amplitude to appear. So the way I think about it is like, I'm not really sure if there's a way to think about it that way, yeah. Um, it's well, the one thing I will say is that the, in the computation, you only use sort of one wormhole to find this ramp. Uh, it's not clear if there's a way to think about what's going on in terms of many wormholes. Okay. Maybe that's more related to the plateau, uh, which I'll talk about tomorrow. So, so just a quick follow-up question. So uh, in, in Maldacena's original paper, he was talking about the issue of the, of the two-point function just decaying to zero if we just took think about it in terms of quasi-normal modes in a semi-classical mm -hmm. background. And he essentially talked about this, uh, you have to include the, the black hole saddle point and also the, 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 oh, the thermal, thermal ADS, ADS saddle point. So is this thermal ADS saddle point sort of related to this uh, baby universe? It's actually completely unrelated. So uh, there's two things I can say about it. One is in GT gravity, there is no thermal ADS. So it, it can't sort of help. The second is that the thermal ADS doesn't give you sort of the right behavior. It gives you something that it oscillates instead of decaying, but it's, it doesn't have the right size and it doesn't have the right sort of noisy behavior. Um, so in higher dimensions, we expect that this, this, there's this wormhole effect, but there's also the thermal ADS effect. The thermal ADS effect is not related to this random matrix theory stuff. Uh, and you can make it small compared to the, uh, you make it not, it's not the right side. You can make it like, it's, yeah. Basically, it's easy to separate the, the wormhole out from this thermal ADS effect. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, any other questions? Okay, so maybe it's a great time to stop the recording.